Okay, uh, I think you can only hear me. Uh, if you cannot, please raise your hand. But everything seems to be okay. Uh, I was asked to introduce uh, Daphna. So today we are hosting Professor Daphna Yoel from Tel Aviv University. Uh, Daphna received her PhD in psychology from Tel Aviv University and she joined the Tau Psychology Department in 98, uh, 99, sorry, 98, 1998, right? Uh, today Daphna is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the Sagol School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv University. Uh, in the past she studied involvement of basal ganglia, thermocortical circuits in normal and abnormal behavior in animal models. But in the last decade she's been studying question related to brain, sex, and gender. A very relevant topic uh, on this tsunami of gender inequality is actually hitting us uh, as we speak. Uh, and it's also a good chance uh, to publicize the lecture on this coming Monday by uh, Yofi Tirosh in the auditorium. So let's welcome Daphne. Uh, so, hi everyone, and uh, I think you have all the background that you need. Uh, can you hear me? So, I want to start my talk about going beyond the binary when we think about sex, brain, and gender with a study that started me on this track. And let's see if we can make this move. Um, okay. And this study uh, tested sex differences in the effects of stress on the brain. And the researchers reported that 30 minutes of stress increased the density of dendritic spines in the right hippocampus in males, but decreased the density of these spines in females. For the researchers, this was simply one other example of sex differences in the brain. But I, looking at these results horizontally instead of vertically, noticed that sex effects on the brain may be opposite under different conditions. In other words, what was typical of females under the no stress conditions was now evident in males, and what was typical of males without stress was uh, typical of stressed females. Um, <clears throat> this uh, study was so astonishing because reversals of sex effects like we see here never happen in a, our reproductive system, for example. So regardless of how stressed someone is, their genital organs will not change from the male form to the female form or vice versa. But in the brain, this happens a lot. So when I started looking for such studies, I found re such reports of reversals of sex effects in many different regions of the brain, in many different features of the brain, and following many different manipulations. Even simply housing rats, one to a cage or several to a cage, is enough to reverse some sex differences in the cortex. And when you look at these uh, studies together, you realize that these interactions between sex and other factors like stress can be different for different brain features. So the same manipulation that reverses a sex effect in one um, variable, for example here in the density of CB1 receptors in the dorsal hippocampus can abolish a sex difference in another measure. In this example in uh, CB1 receptors in the ventral hippocampus. And together these studies challenge the sex binary. So before I explain how they challenge the sex binary, I want to say something about what we can learn from these studies. So these and many other studies clearly show that factors related to sex affect the brain. They affect brain structure, and there are also studies showing that they affect brain uh, function. There are also studies uh, which use manipulations to show that sex-related genes and more hormones can affect brain structure and function. Usually when we hear that sex-related factors affect the brain, we immediately continue to conclude that there must be male and female brain. And what I want to show you today is to dissociate the two. Yes, sex-related factors affect the brain throughout our lives. But this doesn't necessarily mean that there are uh, male brains and female brains. And this type of studies is the reason for this, as I will shortly explain. 
But before I explain how these results challenge the sex binary, I want to say something about the sex binary itself. And the sex binary is a, it's, it's not just a theory, or another hypothesis uh, that we can test. Uh, and Veronica Sands nicely puts it, the problem with the sex binary is that there has never been an hypothesis or a theory to test. It is an epistemological framework that runs behind, above, and beyond particular theories and research projects. And within the sex binary framework, the taken for granted starting point is that there are male and female brains. And this dictates the research method, which is to look for sex differences. And when these are found, they are taken as evidence to the, for the existence of male and female brains. And this is clearly shown in a, a comments of an anonymous reviewer who wrote, the usefulness of the dichotomization into male and female brains stem, stems not only from its biological reality. So this is the taken for granted starting point that there is really male and female brains. But from the fact that there are sex differences in brain function and brain structure, the collective evidence, that is the existence of sex differences, still overwhelmingly warrants categorization of brains as belonging to different, if often overlapping, populations, that is, as female and male brains. And you can see this circular logic, uh, or you can see how this binary framework maintains itself also in the summary diagram from this study. So in this study, the researchers assess the strengths of over 9,000 connections in the human brain. And they found differences in several dozens. And this summarizes the results. So the upper panel shows all the connections that was, were stronger on average in men compared to women, and the lower panel on the connections that were stronger on average in women compared to men. The color code is blue for intrahemispheric uh, intra connection and orange for interhemispheric connections. And the diagram, as well as the accompanying text, reveals the author's assumption that what's typical of the brains of men is to have male typical connections, and what's typical of the brain of women is to have female typical connections. Now, at first, this sounds as a completely logical assumption until we remember that what's typical of men and women could be opposite under different conditions. And therefore, even if at some specific point the entire brain is in the female typical form, then following one of the many, many events that affect the brain, some of the, the form of some of these features will change, the form of the others will not change, and we will end up in a, with a mosaic brain. Mosaic in terms of having both female typical and male typical connections or features. Uh, and I will come back to this later, but I, I will say already now that we tested uh, connectivity also in the human brain, and there are no brains like this. So the blue brain and the orange brain, brain, not only that they are not male typical or female typical, no one has a blue or orange brain. What everyone has is a mosaic, each a unique mosaic of, if you want, blue connections and orange connections. But we'll come back to this. Okay, so this is a mosaic hypothesis which I formulated over a decade ago on the basis of animal studies. And a few years later, uh, we tested the mosaic hypothesis in the human brain. Uh, together with Yaniv Asaf, probably some of you know him. And together we analyzed the structure of over 1,400 human brains. We analyzed gray matter, white matter, connectivity, whatever you can measure with an MRI. I'm going to show you only one analysis of, uh, of the volume of 116 regions of gray matter using VBM for those of you who are doing MRI. Uh, and so we divided each brain into 116 regions, measured the volume of each region in each brain, and wrote it down in a table. In this table, each line represents a single brain, the 116 regions or volumes of, of a brain. To appreciate similarities and differences between the brains of men and women, we then used a color code in which we, uh, if a specific region in a specific brain was relatively large compared to this region in all other brains, men and women combined, then we painted it green. If it was relatively small, we painted it yellow. And when we were done, this is what we saw. So on the left you see brains of men, on the right brains of women and you can easily see the group level differences. 
at the group level, there is more green at the men's side, more yellow at the female, at, at the, sorry, more green at the women's side, more yellow at the men's side. This is something known with VBM, you get that women on average have more gray matter compared to men. So this is what you see here. But you can also see that brains are rarely all green or all yellow. Instead, each brain is a unique mosaic. No two brains are the same. There is room here in the front. So every brain is a unique mosaic of green, which is more common in women, and yellow, which is more common in men. So I want to reiterate that the question for me is not whether there are group level differences between the brains of men and women. There are differences, and there are other reports of differences. I'm also not interested in the question of nature versus nurture. How did these differences got into the brain? But only in whether they add up consistently within each brain to create male and female brains, as many researchers implicitly assumes to be, assume to be the case, or do they mix up to create mosaic brains? And I think that when you look at these images, the answer is quite clear. So <coughs> oh, I'll say something more about this image. So I think this is a very important image. And if you understand it, or it helps you understand how it could be that on the one hand, there are group level differences between men and women. But on the other hand, brains do not come into distinct types. Yes. Very quick question. Are the, the volumes absolute or normalized by the brain size? VBM takes brain size into account, but not in a very good way. So we didn't know that back then. This is all many, almost 10 years ago when the study was actually done. And nowadays, we correct with different uh, methods. And when you do, the differences are too small for the mosaic analysis, because hardly any differences. Yes? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the position against what you are arguing. Right, so if, if someone were to say uh, cats and dogs are different, uh, right, so how, how would you do that from a so it's it's a great it's a great question so let me continue well, and, and okay. keep this question because I think we'll get there okay, okay. we are only in 2015 so you know I had a few <laughs> things a years to think about it okay so instead of thinking of brains as belonging to two types when I look at these images to me it seems that human brains belong to a single highly heterogeneous population of brains in which what's typical of the brains of both men and women is to have these mosaic of features. What I also notice is that there are some rare brain types. For example, in this it's easy to see yellow brains. So most people do not have ye a yellow brain. But of the people that do have a yellow brain, there are more men than women. So if, we, if I want to uh, formulate an hypothesis, I can say that my description of the relations, if you want, between sex category and the brain is that the brain types typical of women are also typical of men and vice versa. But there may be some rare, uh, some tech differences in rare brain types. And I contrast this with a very common assumption that the brain type that is typical of men is different from the brain type typical of women. And I use this uh, illustration just to, you know, like a placeholder to remember what we are talking about. Now, I want to stress that in both formulations of the relations between sex and the brain, the basis is that there are sex gender differences in the brain. Okay, the question is not whether there are differences in single features, but how these uh, differences add up in the whole brain. Whether they add up consistently to create two types of brains, as is the case, for example, in the reproductive system, in which almost all humans have either a set of only uh, male genital organs or only a set of female genital organs, or do they mix up, as we see on the right side, uh, as very rarely happens in the genitalia with intersex individuals. Okay, so if you want our brains male or female, or, or are all brains intersex? Uh, and just to, to illustrate uh, this question, we uh, analyzed uh, the results of or the data of uh, Dick Swab, which analyzed post-mortem uh, information from the human hypothalamus and reported the largest known differences until, I mean, one of the largest known differences in the human brain. And you can see this here. And when you co-analyze, the look together at the distribution, you can already see that there is no correlation between uh, these two measures. And of course, this lack of correlation, this is what will create the mosaic brains. Okay, so if brains are not male or female, 
Oh, and I can just, I want to say about this, uh, the images we just saw, we are now analyzing a very large, large data set from uh, rat brains, and we see the same. So if, if a brain measure shows some overlap between males and females, and this is always the case in humans, but it's not always the case in rats, then you will, in, and you will look at this brain measure together with some others, you will always see mosaic. So this is a very general, we can also see this in rats. So if brains are not male or female, how best to describe the relations between sex and the brain? And we have conducted several types of analysis to try to answer this question. And the first contrasted these two descriptions. Are the brain architectures typical of men uh, different or similar to those typical of women? And we used an anomaly det detection approach. So probably you are familiar with this. So in anomaly detection, you give the algorithm a set of data and train the algorithm on this set of data. And then after it is trained, you give the algorithm new examples. And for each exam, um, new data point, it needs to decide whether this is typical or normal to the training set or abnormal. So it's unsupervised. So what we did is first train the algorithm on half of the brain of one sex category, let's say on the uh, brains of women, and then test the algorithm or let, uh, give the algorithm new brains of men and women, and the algorithm had to decide for each brain whether this is normal, that is fe normal female brain or abnormal. And of course we then did the same, but uh, training first on the brains of men. Now what would be our predictions? So if the typical male brain is different from the typical female brain, we could expect that if we train the, the algorithm on the brains of females, then many more females would be categorized or classified as normal compared to males. Okay? And if we train on the brains of males, the opposite. However, if we all belong to a single highly heterogeneous population of brains, in which what's typical of both men and women is to have this mosaic, each unique mosaic, then we could expect that regardless of whether we train on the brains of men or women, <coughs> the number or the proportion of brains of men and women that are classified as normal would be similar. To make sure that we, uh, this approach can detect two, category, two populations if these existed in the data, as uh, I think the question before uh, was pointing to, we used as a positive control the facial morphology of two primate species. So obviously two populations. And the question is, would the algorithm detect that there are two populations? And the way, uh, oh, for everything that I'm going to show you, we used the data in the original, a high dimension space and following different uh, ways of uh, linear and nonlinear dimension reduction. <coughs> I'm not going to go into this, it's all the same. I mean, we, we get the same result, doesn't depend on the type of dimension reduction. So let's look together at the results. Let's look first on the case in which the model was trained, trained on the brains of macaque. You can see that all data points fall on the y axis meaning that the algorithm never mistakenly classified a capuchin as normal when it was trained on macaques. And similarly, when the algorithm was trained on capuchins, all the data points fall on the x-axis, meaning that the algorithm never mistakenly classified a macaque as a normal capuchin. Okay, so the algorithm does a very good job in distinguishing that there are two populations here, capuchins and macaques. What will happen when we do the same, but this time train on data from uh, MRI data from humans and do this with brains of men and women? So you can see that the results are exactly the opposite. All the data points fall along the y equal x axis. So regardless of whether you train on the brains of men and women, the proportion of men and women that are classified as normal is very similar. And this is also true with another data set. You still want to ask it? Yes. I must ask this question because as a computation and as a machine learning person, we're not very good at detecting. Not only detection is not considered to solve problems, the algorithm will trip The most obvious thing one would expect is discriminating. Why don't you just train an algorithm to discriminate? So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there. So please, you know, if you can. A lot more direct way. We, uh, we will discuss it in a moment, okay? As I said, you know, I've been working about this for a decade, so give me some credit that the very basic questions I already just asked. Why you started with the open, you have a discriminating question, you started with the open. No, because the question, so let me, we'll get there in a minute, okay? 
My question is how best to describe uh, uh, the relations between sex and the brain. What you are asking is whether we can use brain structure to predict sex category. I wasn't very interested in this question because if I want to predict your sex category, I really don't need to put you in an MRI. Uh, so there are much better ways to do this. So the question for me is, I know your sex category. What can I say about your brain? Okay, so be bear with me. So we'll get there, okay? Okay, so we wanted to complement this approach by, by, uh, with using unsupervised cluster analysis uh, in contrast to the suggestions that we've just received. And here what we do is we give the algorithm and we use several algorithms. We give the algorithm all the brains but without the sex category. And we ask the algorithm to, clus to cluster brains the best it could account for the variability in these brains into two or three up to ten clusters. And of course, we know that this is actual uh, information. These are the brains that you saw before after dimension reduction, and you see the two dimensions that best differentiate between the brains of men and uh, women. And we know the sex category of each individual. So after we have the clusters, we can test how many men and women were in each cluster. And again, we can look at the predictions. So again, if the typical male brain is different from the typical female brain, uh, then we could expect that we will have two large clusters, one with mainly the brains of men, the other with mainly the brains of women. Uh, however, if brains all belong to a single highly heterogeneous population, then what we could expect is that in large clusters, which uh, represent a typical human brain, this is why they are large, there are many individuals there, the proportion of men and women would be similar, whereas in small uh, clusters which represent rare brain types, we can expect that some of them at least will show large gender differences or sex differences. And, and again, we, we use uh, two uh, uh, clustering uh, algorithms and different dimension reduction methods. And we did it on several data sets. I'm only going to show you one. So what we're going to look at is the, the uh, proportion of men and women in a cluster, the larger of the two, so it will start with from 0.5, as a function of the size of the cluster. And what you can see is that as predicted, the larger the cluster, the more likely it is that the proportion of men and women would be very similar, close to 0.5. And you can see that only in very small clusters, the proportion of one sex is much higher than the proportion of the other sex. So it's raises very, uh, very late. I didn't bring here, but uh, if you take a, a sample that does have two populations, then the, what you get is opposite. So you, what you get is that the larger the cluster, the more uh, it is likely to have only men or only women. Another thing that we could do once we already had the clusters is to ask what are the chances that two men or two women or a man and a woman are in the same cluster and the, the chances were very similar. So what this means is that knowing someone's sex category doesn't allow you to predict whether this someone's brain would be similar or different to your brain and in what ways. Okay, so to summarize these two studies, uh, we can see that the brain architectures that are typical of women are also typical of men and vice versa but there are a lot of gender differences in some rare brain types. I don't want, or architectures, I don't want to go into this in too much detail, especially because we haven't tested this, but this can help or can account for large sex gender differences in some rare brain conditions, such as, for example, autism. So if the used to be the most common uh, brain hypothesis of autism was the extreme male brain hypothesis of autism, which assumed that the typical male brain is different from the typical female brain, and autistic brains are toward the extreme male brain. So this assumption is that the typical male brain is a little autistic compared to the typical female brain. In our formulation, you don't need to assume this. The fact that there is a large sex gender difference in some rare brain condition, because obviously, although there are more boys than girls that are diagnosed with autism, autism is rare also in boys. Okay, so it's a rare human condition. So the fact that you have a large sex gender differences in some condition doesn't mean that the typical male or female uh, brain is somehow 
uh, going to this direction. And last is that sex category provides little information on brain structure. Um, and I want to say something about this because, uh, because, and I will get to this in a minute, because you can use brain architecture to predict sex category with um, uh, accuracy above chance, and I will talk a little bit about this in a minute. I was interested to understand how brains are organized in space in a way that on the one hand you can use uh, brain architecture to predict sex category, but then sex category provides almost no information on brain architecture. And what we, um, I think the answer for this, and again, this is going beyond the binary framework. In the binary framework, the only question that we ask is, are men and women the same or different? And when you start to think of, about this, the answer is neither. Men and women are not the same and are not different. What's the best way to think about it is that we are all different and sex category provides, provides very little information on how. Now, just to, again, to give you a binary system as a comparison, think of the genitalia. So we are all different in our genitalia. No two persons look exactly alike. But sex category provides a lot of information on how two individuals of the genitalia of two individuals would be similar or different. It doesn't for the brain. And just to give you some sense of what it means that we are all different and sex category provides little information on how, we looked at the uh, data from the bio ba uh, UK Biobank and we looked at the distribution of distances in high dimension space between each two brains. And I will go with, uh, together with you. So what you see here, let's start with women in red. So we have the distribution of the distances between all two two women, every pair of two women. This is in solid red. And we have the distribution of every woman, woman from every man. This is in dotted red. And you can see that the two are exactly overlapping. So the distribution of distances between any two brains is overlapping. I am as likely to be distant from uh, Leon that I am from Orna. Okay, sex category doesn't provide information. And you can see the same for men. Another thing that you can see here, and this is important for any one of you who is working in high dimension space, but still maintains a logic of a low dimension space. So in contrast to normal distributions or in single dimension space, where most observations fall around the mean, so the mean is very, uh, gives a lot of information because most of the observations are around the mean, you can see that here the observation starts 15 standard deviations away from the mean. So the center of the distribution is empty in contrast to a single dimension or two dimensions. The center of the distribution, uh, I mean the average of the distribution is empty and observation starts very far from the mean if we want to, get to have a sense. So think of it in three dimensions. So it's like a balloon that, and all the, all the dat data points fall on the uh, periphery of this balloon. Nothing is in the middle. Next, we wanted to look at the dis distances between every brain and the average male and female brain. So we can, cal you know, the, it's a mathematical average and we can look at this. And again, you can see this, so this is zero at the beginning. So you can see the same picture. The distribution of distances between every woman and the average male brain is the same as the distribution of every woman and the average female brain. So even though there is a difference, and this is the distance between the average male and female brain, is about one standard deviation. It's not a small distance. In single dimension space, this, is, this would be equivalent, it's quite a large distance in a single dimension space. But in, uh, in a high dimension uh, space in which brains reside, this distance between the average gives you no information. Because I'm not, not more likely to be closer to the average female brain than I am likely to be closer to the average male brain. In, whereas if I were in a single dimension, then I could do this. Now the fact that there is a distance, uh, distance here means that you can predict, and here we get to what you were looking for, that we can predict sex category on the basis of brain structure. And we and others have shown this. A very short clarification. Yes. In the previous slide, the data is based on anatomical regions of MRI. Yes. Right? 
So the statement is about the anatomical difference, not the functional difference. No, we'll get to the function, but this is all anatomy. And also the way you divide the regions might influence the result. Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, data taken from the UK Bauer Bank. Sure, so it's an anatomical statement. Anatomical statement. Yes, everything that I've said up until now is about the anatomy. Okay, so the question of prediction. We and others have shown that you can use many different supervised learning algorithms to predict sex category on the basis of brain structure. And also others shown uh, on the basis of data from the EEG or MRI. And the accuracy of prediction, this is more tricky. So if you correct, if you do not correct for brain size, it can be very accurate. It could be over t uh, 90 percent, which is really, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but if you correct for brain size, then it goes down to about between 60 and 70 percent. Still better than chance, but as I said, you know, if this was your task to predict sex categories are more accurate and cheaper ways to do this. Another thing is, is that uh, the prediction doesn't transfer. So if you uh, create uh, the prediction on the basis of brains of Israelis, then it doesn't predict well the brains of Chinese or Japanese or Americans. Uh, and the last thing is that if you use different um, algorithms, then they do not agree above chance. So, um, um, so it, it, they, it, they work independently. And again, if you think of genitalia, if we were to predict sex category on the basis of genitalia, then one, someone might uh, look at the uh, penis versus clitoris, someone else would create a criterion according to ovaries versus testes, someone else prostate uh, and, and womb, but all three algorithms would agree that this person is male and this person is female. This doesn't happen in the brain, so they are independent. They do not agree more than expected by chance. But, but still, let's, let's try to understand, because I was uh, you know, struggling with this for a long time, exactly because of what you were asking. And uh, some researchers, and again, this just gives you the, how strong the binary framework are. So when our paper in 2015 came out saying that there are no male and female brains because everyone is mosaic, this was the response for, for Rosenblatt from Weizmann Institute and some others, uh, claiming that because you could predict sex category on the brain, or basis of brain structure, this means that brains are typically male or female. Uh, and what's, uh, now this is less common, but what is happening now is that uh, because people so strongly believe that sex category is an important factor in determining brain structure, then some, sometimes they will reduce all the information in, in MRI, for example, into a single dimension, uh, which is the likelihood that uh, the brain owner is male or female. So this is you know, very important. Uh, so on the one hand we have this, and on the other hand we have the fact that sex category provides little information on human brain structure. Now, how can this uh, be together? And we are still being asked this, uh, you know, when when we submit papers. So just to give you an intuition about this, the most easy way to, because you can use very sophisticated algorithms, but even in, with a very simple rule of thumb. You can look at the female typical brain features in the brain and the male typical features in, in the brain. And if there are more female typical features than male typical features, then you can predict that this brain comes from a female. And if it's the other way around, you can predict that it comes from a male and you can be quite accurate with this. Of course, with better <laughs> algorithms, you can be more uh, accurate. Uh, if we look at the actual data, and this is the data, again, the sample that I showed you before, but this time looking only at 10 features, the features showing the largest sex differences in that data set, which had over 100 uh, features. And you can see the distribution of the number of female typical by minus the number of male typical out of these 10 features. And you can see that they, are, they distribute, well, not exactly normally, but uh, uh, in a way that most features fall around the equal number of male typical and female typical features. And even more importantly, oh, okay, I'll stay with this. So what it means is that uh, the reverse prediction is quite useless. So while you could use this difference to predict sex category with accuracy of about 80%, then the reverse prediction 
it is not very useful. Why? Because if I know that you are male, I can predict that there is 80% chance that you will have more male typical brain features than female typical brain features. But I would not know what the difference is. And more importantly, I wouldn't know which combination you have with only these 10 features. Uh, okay, so we're talking about thousands and thousands of possible com combinations. And this is why it is true that you can take a highly dimensional uh, data in highly dimension space that has some variability accounted for by sex and with other measures, uh, I think the, the field is coming into a figure of 1%. So about 1% of the um, variance in the brain architecture can be accounted by sex category. But then you have the 90-90% to, to account for, and sex category gives you no information about this. So would it be, is it worth maintaining a binary framework just because, yes, you could use sex, you know, brain architecture to predict sex category? I don't think so. I think it's, it's, a, it's not a good idea because instead of studying the vast variability of human brain structure and how it relates to different endpoints, too many researchers are still believing strongly that sex category is important and are either reducing it to male and female brains or into a single dimension, ignoring most of the variability in the human brain. And, and what I want to show you now is that uh, is evidence from function, the function of the brain, that sex category indeed is not a, ma a major predictor of, of human brain function. And, and this is a study, maybe yeah, you've seen it. So what they have done is look for, uh, they reviewed all the studies that looked at sex diff gender differences in functional MRI, and they looked at the relations between the num number of significant uh, differences and the size of the sample. And the idea is that, and you all know this, very basic, so the larger the sample, the more power the sample has to detect differences. So we should expect that if the brains are indeed uh, male or female, so if there is some kind of, I don't know how, but there is some meaningful distinction between male brains and female brains, uh, then we should expect that the larger the sample, the more differences we would find because the sample will have more power to detect the differences that are really there. However, if we all belong to a single population, then this would not happen. And this is what they found. So there is no relation between the number of significant differences in functional MRI and the size of the sample, which contradicts the assumption that brains are somehow typically male or female in terms of their function. And this is just another study that I, I like. So what they do, did is look at many studies that uh, looked at the neural substrates um, that underlie sexual arousal. And um, they did something very similar to us. So they did find sex differences between men and women. Most studies will stop, at he stop here, and this will be the title, uh, which will say sex differences in brain response to erotic stimuli, and will explain immediately why, you know, why this is it, and etc. Et but they looked at other things that could account for the variability in human brain function when people are watching erotic stimuli. And you can see that sex category explains the least variability, least by far. Stimulus type, presentation paradigm, even machine power, even whether you, they were using a, a one and a half Tesla or three Tesla MRI, explained more variability in the human response, in the brain response to erotic stimuli than sex category. Could you use a variability, uh, could you use the, the information about how the brain reacts to uh, erotic stimuli to predict sex category? Yeah, probably yes, because there is some uh, variance that is expanded. It could be enough. What was the measure of the uh, I don't remember, you need to look at it. It was a fMRI when there were, I don't remember, you need to look at this, okay? So just again to show you that the fact that sex category could be predicted doesn't mean that it is an important predictor of brain function or structure. Um, okay, L let's stop here, for example, before we go beyond the brain to other domains. Yes, you had a question. Yeah, in the correlation Just look. <coughs> no. <laughs> the correlation study, in the correlation between sample size. Yes. Uh, 
outliers, the really big sample sizes? You can look at the, uh, at the analysis. It just seems to be really attracted to the really big sample size. I don't think, do you see any correlation uh, in the small? I, I can't know by eye. So read the paper, okay? Read the paper. It's David et al. Uh, and, and you can find the answer. Okay, their, their conclusion was that there is sex uh, by, uh, reporting bias in, in, the, in this field. Uh, okay, additional questions before we move on. So I want to stress, okay, just I want to stress something. And sex, your sex category affects your brain. As we are speaking here, the fact that some of us have higher testosterone levels, others have higher progesterone or estradiol, etc., it's always affecting our brain. So remember, sex-related factors do affect the brain, but because these uh, effects interact with so many other variables, in, and these interactions are complex and can also reverse the effects of sex, this is why sex category is not a, a predictor. It's not because sex category doesn't affect your brain, but it's not a very good predictor because of the many different in interactions for the many different brain features. Yes? Yeah, so I guess I, I sort of understand the position against which you are arguing. Because my understanding, when people say the word male typical and female typical brain, I assume they, they mean that you can train a class and experiment if you can, right? Like in, in the high dimensional space, the brains are different. And the reason why people care about this is because a male and female behavior is different, right? So, so if you want to say, okay, maybe differences in, in the brain explain the differences in behavior, so that's a reason to think about male and female brains because they're they're different in the high dimensional space, right? So their their prediction of any given feature is not really what people are interested. In. Like some people might be, right? But that's what people mean when they say male, male typical and female typical. So I think uh, you have a, another binary assumption, and this is that the behavior, behaviorally we belong to two types. So we'll get to it in a minute, because okay. we don't. In the high dimensional space, you can separate it with other high degree values. What? No, I didn't understand. In, in, in behavior, behavior also, so on any given axis of behavior, it's true that uh, it will be difficult to predict uh, what the behavior will be based on whether they're male or female. But in the high dimensional space, no, just uh, the, it's the other way around. So it, on every single feature, I will ex because I assume that you are male. So on every single feature, I will have to predict that you have you are masculine, okay? And for a single feature, this would be my best bet. But also for ten features, I will have to bet that you are you have ten masculine features, and I will be absolutely wrong, okay? No, no that's not what you would be doing, right? You, 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 if you have a lot of variables about my behavior, like. Uh, what I like to do, what my hobbies are, what my job is, and so forth, right? The more variables about my behavior that you have, the more you can be certain without knowing my sex, right? The more you can be certain that I'm male. Right. Because, because behaviors are discriminable in my opinion. But I don't, see, I, I didn't speak to you even one word, and I know you are male. So this is a, this is a beauty. The prediction, I don't need your behavior, all your brain predict you are male. There are much better predictors for that. But the question for me is, I know you are male. What can I say about your brain or behavior, okay? And what I showed you about the brain is that I can say nothing about your brain, even though I know you are a male. What, the only thing I can say is that had I, you know, if I had the MRI uh, feature from your brain and the correct uh, sample, because it has to be an Israel sample, uh, it can be a Japanese sample, for example, then I would have a chance of, let's say, 80% to predict that you are male but I use the fact that you are made to make this, so it's completely circular. I didn't gain any information about knowing that you are male, about your brain structure, except for saying that had I known your brain structure, I would be able to predict with 80% accuracy that you are male. For me, this is boring, but if you want to do it, I mean, you know, be my guest, do this. I think I showed you quite convincingly, I think, at least I am convinced, that sex category provides very little information on brain structure. Now for me the question as a scientist or as a neuroscientist whether I should keep looking at sex differences or maybe move on to look at other factors that maybe account for more variability in the human brain as we just saw in this study. You know, if you were stuck on sex differences you would have found sex differences. But is this the best predictor of human brain response to erotic stimuli? No, stimulus type and presentation paradigm and sexual orientation are much better prediction, predictors. 
Okay, so, so it's a question of the reverse prediction, not of whether you can predict sex category, but whether sex category gives you information about the brain. And I want to again stress, I think this is a great example of how strongly the sex binary is in our perception, that it is really hard to let go of the strong belief the sex category is a very important predictor of human brain and behavior. And I don't think, it, you know, take time and think about it, but I think this all shows the, how strong or how prevalent the binary assumption is. And it's not about the brain. Yes, please. I think we have a slight actual difference here because if what I'm taking from your talk is that uh, if I know whether you're a female or male, then each particular brain uh, structure, I have some probability that's higher And I, I didn't hear that. I will never say if I have a binary problem. I'm never saying that they, they're all fo one type focus on the center of the other and one. I know that there's a distribution, and all I know is that if I take a particular feature, then if I belong to one class, I'm more likely to have it than the other one. But that's very useful information. That's, I would consider, very important. How, how is it how is you, for, for example, uh, if, if you were doing fMRI, you were studying uh, the neural substrate of language, and you asked me, I would say don't put sex category as a factor in your analysis. You know why? Because it will just give you many uh, false positive results. And this is what, what is happening in this field. This, in this, this field, field, this paradigm is what machine learning is all about. This is how we are able to identify No, you can, no, you can so use, my, one word no, you, you one. can use machine learning uh, machine learning is a tool. The question is, what is your question? And for me, the question is, how best to describe, this is the question it's written up there, how best to describe the relations between sex and the brain? And using whatever a uh, classifier doesn't give you this answer. It only answers the question, are the brains of men and women exactly the same or not? Because if they are not exactly the same, then the classifier will give you this, uh, will be able to classify. It doesn't give you an answer regarding whether, no, it doesn't give you an answer regarding whether sex category is a very important predictor of brain, of uh, human brain structure. For this, you need to do other, you could use machine learning, we've used machine learning. The question is, what are you using? It's not about the machine, it's what, what, what is the question? I suggest that I move forward because I, I'm not sure I can convince you. Uh, so, the binary framework affects not only our, uh, when, so I want to leave, oh, well, we had some. So, the binary framework affects not only how we think about sex and the brain, but also how we think about sex itself. And, um, and I, I'll talk about a little bit about sex hormones. So, we all familiar with sex-related hormones, and many people think about them as male and female hormones. Again, applying the binary framework to, this time, sex itself, if you want. <coughs> uh, but again, this is a very biasing or misleading perception or formulation, because all these hormones appear in all humans. <coughs> the average levels of estradiol and progesterone are quite, are quite similar in men, males and females, also in humans. Uh, with the main deviation being uh, pregnant women, which are uh, a species of the self in terms of the levels of these hormones. Testosterone indeed is higher on average in men compared to women, but there is some overlap. This is the levels of testosterone in, in saliva in humans. So you can, see the, you can see the large sex gender difference, but you can also see the overlap. And more importantly even, is hormone levels, in contrast to genitalia or to sex category, are dynamic. They are always changing. And we are used to think about this in relation to the female estrus cycle or menstrual cycle, but this is also true of males. And this is from uh, mice, so each panel here is the levels of testosterone in dotted lines in a single uh, mouse, and in a male mouse, and you can see how it fluctuates. So the baseline levels are quite low, and then can rise a lot, and you can see that each mouse is different. What is the schedule? Days, hours? It's a single day, 24 hours. Uh, and hormones levels are not only dynamic because of internal factors, but they are also responsive to the environment and to experiences. And these are, in brackets, are a few things that have been shown to affect testosterone levels in males and females. So it can, you can see that it's competition, sexual thoughts, parenting, etc. And these, by the way, are all gendered behaviors. 
So we can see that not only sex affect gender, if you want, but also gender, what is considered appropriate for males and females, affect sex itself. So when we think of, uh, of all of this, uh, and now we think about finding a sex difference in an endpoint. It can be a, a size of a specific feature of the brain or any other brain uh, endpoint that you are interested in. So it could be something about genes or hormones, expected genes or hormones that is affecting uh, this endpoint and causing the difference. But it can also be many, many other variables that on average are different between males and females. These can be physiological variables like height or muscle to fat uh, ratio or you know, other features. It can be features of the environment and in humans, of course, we have gender. Uh, as uh, the way I use gender is here is the social structure, or the binary social systems that attributes meaning to whether someone has male or female genitalia. And gender and the environment affect, as I've just showed you, uh, sex itself too. So there are very complex interactions here between the different features. So when you take a group of males and a group of females, you do not have two distinct sets in all of these features as you do in respect to the genitalia, okay? It is much more likely that each of us is a mosaic of sex gender related variables. Okay, so we do not have to, it's not that one group is male, one group is female, the same way that one group received as a drug and the other group did not receive the drug. But there is a lot of overlap uh, and um, mosaicism also in sex itself. And similarly, regarding gender, this is for your question there. So are there men and women? So do we need male and female brains to explain why men are from Mars and women are from Venus? So are we from Mars and Venus? So again, there are many differences between men and women in many different variables. Most of the differences are much smaller than you know, typically we believe. So differences in cognition and personality are typically very small. There are larger differences in behaviors and interests. Uh, again, I'm not interested in the question of where did these differences come from, nature or nurture, but only in do they add up to create two types of humans, men and women, or do they mix up as we sh uh, saw in the brain. And what we did here is we analyzed the uh, several data sets altogether. We analyzed the behaviors, attitudes, preferences, etc., of over 5,000. Uh, people. In each data set, we took the variables showing the largest sex gender differences in that sample. So for example, here in this uh, uh, sample, we chose seven variables, communication, self-esteem, etc. And for each of these variables, we define the feminine and masculine ends of the distribution according to the actual data in that sample. So for example, um, if someone uh, was really worried about their weight, then it was colored pink, because in this sample, as in many other samples, women were more uh, worried about their weight than men were. And if someone had very high self-esteem, then it was blue, because in that sample, men had higher self-esteem than uh, women did. And just a comment, uh, usually when you do find gender differences in a sample, usually they uh, fit some stereotype. The other way is not always true. So not every stereotype is backed by data, but when you do find a difference, usually the, there would be an appropriate stereotype for this. Okay, so again, you see the results. Again, each line is a single individual, self characteristics of a single individual. You can easily see the group level differences, more blue at the men's side, more pink at the women's side. Has to be this way, this is how we define what's feminine and what's masculine. You can also see that there is quite a lot of blue in the pink and quite a lot of pink in the blue. And this is because there is overlap for any known psychological variable between men and women. We were not interested in this, this is known. What we wanted to know is whether there are pink and blue uh, humans and in this sample and also in another very large one, there was not even a single individual who had all seven characteristics in the feminine or all seven in the masculine form. And we've recently launched a website, and uh, you can look at it later, in which you answer a set of questions and then you receive your uh, mosaic, or how feminine or masculine or neutral you are in each uh, variable. And you can look at this compared to different 
um, cultures or samples because obviously what's masculine or feminine varies across cultures. So this is my mosaic in comparison to the American sample, in comparison to a Japanese sample, and in comparison to an Israeli sample. So you can see that mosaic changes, although of course my answers have not changed. So I will stop uh, here and maybe we'll have a few last minutes for questions. <laughs>